I sit down and Dakota starts waving at me. <laughs> I turn around and everybody else is waving at me, I tell you. Uh, as we look at just a few announcements coming into the week, of course, tomorrow night is Celebrate Recovery at 6 o'clock. If you know anybody that could use that ministry, be sure to let them know to be here. If you need it, be sure to show up from 6 to 8. Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock will be a prayer time here for anyone at this, be in a prayer room, usually from about 2 to 3. On Tuesday morning, the mobile pantry will be out at the fairgrounds again. So if you need any kind of food or help, be sure to be out there for that. Wednesday night, adult Bible study. And next Saturday is prayer here at the church at, uh, at 9, from 9 to 10. Just kind of a come and go prayer. You can be here for the whole hour or come whenever you want to and leave. So uh, that's what's going on this week at the cross. Besides the market will be out there Mondays and, and Thursday this week. So be praying for the, those who will be out there serving. If you'd like to serve, hey, come out and help. Uh, be there Monday about, oh, if you get there about 10, 30, 11 o'clock. And Thursday, probably about 3, 3, 30. So um, thank you. And be praying for those ministries this week. As we turn our hearts towards uh, worship and celebrating the Lord this morning, I want to read you a passage of Scripture from Psalms 113. 
It says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore from the rising of the sun and to the setting of the same. The name of the Lord is to be praised. For the Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory is above all the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, seated on the heights, who stoops down to look upon the heavens and the earth? And, and David just pinned that just to get us to really focus on celebrating and honoring and worshiping the Lord our God. And that's what we want to do today, isn't it? Honor him, to praise him, to celebrate him. Whether it's in music, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in his word, just to lift up the name of the Lord and just carry that joy with us throughout the week. Holy One, we just welcome your presence this morning. Let your Holy Spirit just settle here. May we tune out, Lord, the noise of life, the noise of, of stuff that's going on in our world, and really tune into the voice of your Holy Spirit. And to let him work his healing, life-giving touch in our lives to restore, renew, encourage, to convict, and to show us, Lord, the way to live. For, Lord, we want to celebrate you this day and allow your spirit to work on our hearts, to mold us and shape us in the image of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we gather together. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Stand, please, if you would, this morning.
just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul ever since you rescued me you gave my heart a song to sing i'm living for the world to see nobody but jesus i'm living for the world to see nobody but jesus why you ever chose me has always been a mystery all my life i've been told i belong at the end of a line with all the other not quite all that never get it right but it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time Somebody to save my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. Living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. Moses had stage fright. David brought a rock to a sword fight. Pick 12 outside as nobody would have chosen and you changed the world. Well, the moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose. So when I hear that devil start talking to me saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody. I'm trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. Living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. Let me go down, down, down in the history. As another blood bought, faithful member of the family. And if they all Get my name, well that's fine with me. Living for the world to see, nobody but Jesus. Let me go down, down, down in the history. As another blood bought, faithful member of the family. And if they all forget my name, well that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see.
just the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one you could ever see. trust is in the Lord our God, isn't it? Not in anything else or anyone else. He's the only firm foundation that we have. And would you come to this time of prayer this morning? It's sometimes just a reminder that, that Lord, we're putting our trust in you above everything and anything else. And as we come to prayer, if you would like to just come to the altar this morning, you're welcome to come anytime. If you'd like to come this morning and kneel at the altar and, or stand at the altar and just pour your heart out to the Lord, we invite you to do so. And you might find a brother or sister come by and just kind of stand behind you say, we're with you. I want you to know that, that you're not standing alone before the Lord. So as we sing our prayer song, we invite you to come to the altar this morning. You stand if you would. Who am I that
eternal, our God. Our hearts just, first of all, are filled with joy this morning at just being in your presence. At the awesome time where we can just have of coming before you with brothers and sisters and singing and praying and, and being part of a community of believers. Father, help us to realize how blessed of a people we are because of your love for us, the grace you've shown us, the truth you've given us, for the light you've, you've lit, enlightened our hearts and our darkness with. And Father, may we honor you by the things that we say, by the things that we do, by the life that we live. And Father, there are many, many brothers and sisters on our hearts this morning. Many we know just have a special need. We ask, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you'll bless them and touch them, encourage them. Helping them, Lord, as they deal, whether it's loss, Lord, or sickness, or questions, or problems, disease. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus, you'll surround them with your presence, you'll encourage them, you'll draw them to you, Lord, that, that you'll work a mighty miracle in their life that only they realize it's you, and you'll get the glory. And Father, I pray for each of us to stand here, kneel here this morning, that your spirit would just shine the light of your word and your love in our hearts. Show us your ways, O Lord, and teach us your path. Guide us in your truth and teach us. As David said, for you are God, our Savior, for our hope is in you all day long. We bless you, Father, and rejoice in you this morning. And thank you for the ways you are at work and for what you are doing and for what you're going to do. May you get the glory and the honor and the praise. And we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said... Dad, you got a minute? Yeah. Okay, listen, it's about that movie, okay? Something we've already talked about the movie. I know we already talked about the movie, okay? Some of my friends are going to see the movie, mm -hmm. okay? And so what I'm saying is, I know the message of the movie does not coincide with the message of the Bible, okay? I'm aware of that. But it's just a little message, okay? It's just a little bit, so I don't think it matters, okay? And there, I know, there is some gore in the movie, okay? But listen, it's just a little gore, just a little, okay? And I know it's not real, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's some cussing, or as you would say, language in the movie, okay? Okay, and I know it's not real, okay? 
And there's some nudity. Son. Okay. Don't let me hear me. Let me finish, okay? It's just a little nudity. It's just a little. And I know it's not real. Son. No, Dad, please. Please, can I please go see the movie? Please. Okay. I knew it. You don't ever let me do anything. I don't even know why I asked you son, what. Son, I said you can go see the movie. You're the best dad ever. Thanks. Okay, well, I knew we were gonna have this conversation, so I decided that I would make you my famous brownies. <laughs> These have been in the family for generations, for decades. Thanks. I'm gonna take it with me and sneak it in the theater. Oh, no, 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 son. I want you to go ahead and eat the brownie now. Okay. Huh? Yeah, I want you to go ahead and eat it now. Okay. Same great ingredients that I've always put in the brownie, son. Since you were a little kid, mm. eggs, the cocoa, the butter, the flour, the vanilla. But I added something this time. Just a little bit of something, but you, I added something. You shouldn't mess with perfection. Point, son. Mm. No. Was it paprika? No. Was it allspice? No. Was it allspice? No. What was it? Dog poop. <laughs> Dog poop. It is dog poop. Mm. From the big dog or the little dog? Little dog. Mm. That's a load off. What? The next time you don't want me to go see a movie, just say, son, don't go see the movie. Don't feed me poop brownies. I don't even want to see the movie now. I just want to go get something to drink. There better be lemonade in the rep I don't know if I can follow that up, but I'm going to try. <clears throat> uh, ever been tempted? You ever been tempted? You know, may, maybe none of you have, but there's moments, even yet, I get tempted, you know. And uh, temptation is kind of like, it's just a little bit, right? It won't, it won't matter. But I don't want any poop in my brownies. I don't know about you guys, but I just, that's, and even if it's just a little bit, right? Um... We're going to deal with temptation. We're looking at the life of Jesus over the next several weeks about some things he went through. And do you know Jesus was tempted? He was tempted. Then Jesus was led into the, by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answers, Written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Temptations, right? Sometimes temptations are bold. Sometimes they're sneaky, right? Most of them come to places where they kind of poke and pick at things we struggle with, our fears, our desires, our needs, kind of some things that we're worried about. And Jesus was tempted too, right? And the temptations of Jesus are kind of focused on how he's going to use his power, how he's going to relate to his creation, those kind of things. If you notice, you know, in a lot of temptations, the devil comes to us. But here Jesus goes out to face the devil. In other words, he's going kind of in, in our stead. He's kind of saying, I, I know the things that my children need to help them get through this. And I'm going to go out and face the Satan head on demons inhabited in a place of, of trial and struggle but it's also a place of spiritual growth so he goes out to meet the devil on his territory okay jesus doesn't wait he goes out in a sense he's fasted for 40 days he's preparing himself uh, to go into the ministry his ministry and now satan shows up 
And so the testing, the word testing means he's come to be shown the, the true nature of Jesus' character, the true nature of his heart in this testing. That's what testing does. It reveals what's given. It's revealing the, the desires and things in your own heart. I like what Hebrews says. Hebrews 4, 14 to 15 says, Therefore, we have a great high priest who's gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. See that? Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I have been tempted. Okay? Temptation is not a sin. When you give in to temptation, it becomes sin. So it says Jesus was tempted in every way that you're tempted. You think about all the things you struggle with. Jesus was tempted in every way that you were, but he never gave in. That means he's able to help us. He's able to work with us in those moments of temptation. And we find, of course, the tempter here is the devil, right? The Hebrew word for the devil is the Satan. We use Satan as a proper name, but it really is is a category. Satan means tempter, okay? Kind of somebody who's pointing his finger and attacking somebody. Anytime we accuse somebody, anytime we uh, criticize somebody, we're playing the role of the Satan in Hebrew, okay? And why does God allow Satan to hang around? Do you ever wonder that? That's a question I get every so why, why does it, if he's all powerful and all knowing, why doesn't he just do away with him? That will take care of most of the stuff we struggle with, right? And the Bible just simply says it's a divine mystery. We don't allow the Satan to hang out in this world and work on his people. We just know that he's allowed him. And there's a reason. I trust my God enough to know that there's a purpose and a reason for why he does things. Amen. So the Satan comes to turn Jesus away from his God-ordained task, right? And he, he, he senses, oh, if, 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 kind of makes, creates a doubt, right? Because the, the, the Satan will use people, who use natural things, who he'll use religion to try to get you away from following the true God. And the power of temptation is a deception that the sin will give you more, whatever you're looking for, more pleasure, more security, more whatever than God will. Think about that. It's saying you'll have more pleasure, more security, more power, more whatever than God can give you. Which is not quite a state when you think about it. Because we're talking about the all-powerful, all-knowing word. We're saying, well, that's going to give me more power than he will. That's going to give me more what I seek than he will. And that's what temptation does. So let's look at Jesus' three temptations here. The first temptation says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, you know, say to these, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it's written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus had fasted for 40 days to prepare himself for God's work, right? And hunger is a natural desire, okay? We all get hungry, right? I just get hungry for chocolate chip cookies more often than I should. You know what I mean, Dakota? But it's a natural desire. So Satan is using a natural desire against Jesus, right? And remember, there's another place in Scripture Satan used food to tempt somebody. Remember where that was? What? I heard it. Garden of Eden? Garden of Eden, right? I mean, God would make... Think about this. God had... There's the apple pie tree, right? And there's the chocolate chip cookie tree. And, and God said, don't eat from the broccoli tree. You know? Well, I don't think it was chocolate chip cookies or apples on a tree. I think it was broccoli or something like that, you know? And the devil shows up and says, man, you really have to have broccoli. And they gave in, right? <laughs> he was tempted by food. And they gave in. Tactic on Jesus, right? You, you, you just need to have bread, man. You're starving. You're hungry. So if you really are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Right? I mean, it was a very desolate place, a very lonely place. He was a pretty barren place. And, and a lot of times, in, in, uh, even in, in Israel, there are stones that kind of look like little loaves of bread, you know, like the pita bread you've seen flat kind of that way, or just a little stone right here. It looks like bread. Just make it become bread, 
okay? And, and, and do that because you're hungry, right? It's a temptation to use his divine power for selfish reasons. You know, how would Jesus use his God-given abilities? How would he use them, right? And it's kind of like, you know, the people thought when the Messiah came, he would feed them all the time. They would never have to work again. They could just, you know, I guess have their own tree in the backyard. They could get what they want from him, be fed all the time. So it's kind of, be what the people want you to be all the time, right? Be popular. Be popular. I wonder how much does Satan use fitting in to get us to do things that we know we shouldn't do? How many, how many times does he says, oh, you know, everybody, everybody else is going to the movie? First of all, not everybody else is going to the movie. Everybody couldn't fit in the theater, Amen. But you know, even Satan can use even church people. Or that's what everybody's told me at church, so it must be that way. And we don't stop to think, but is it really what God's telling me? Is it really what God's saying? Is it really what God's teaching? Be careful, because sometimes there's this desire to fit in and hits us as Christians. Because we don't want to think my Christian brother and sister thinks, thinks that I'm not caught up on all the latest whatever it is that's going on, or I'm not as spiritual as he or she is. So maybe I better just kind of go, hey, do, think, and act like everybody wants you to say, do, and act. But a Christian will say, do, and act like Jesus wants us to say, do, and act. Are you with me on that? Not what everybody else wants me to say, do, and act. So Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy here. It says, from, from Deuteronomy 8.3, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus quotes from part of that verse. And in Deuteronomy, God is reminding the Israelites that he had taken care of them all the way through the wilderness. All the way, I've cared for you. I've provided for you. And, and they were complaining. You know, they were whiners and complainers. It's like Jesus saying, I'm not going to give in like they did. I am not going to bow down to you like they did. Because what sustains me is not the bread for the body. It's the bread for the soul, the bread for the spirit, the bread of my father right here. That's what sustains me. Because a life based on food is a very poor life. But a life based on my father is a wonderful life. Now catch this. Remember this, okay? This should be able to do something. It is a bad idea. Amen? Whenever the devil wants you to do something, it's a bad idea. And Satan will do whatever he can to bring doubt into your life. Doubt yourself. Doubt God. Doubt people. Doubt the church, right? And he'll tempt you to be what others think you should be or what others want you to be or maybe what you think others want you to be. And when you get into temptation, it's going to pull you down and sink you so quick, you won't even realize it. Some years back, there was a fishing tournament. Not a fishing tournament, but there was fish, tuna, running about 30 miles off the coast of Cape Cod. First time in, in about 40 years that it happened. You can't catch a tuna in a small boat. People did anyway, because the Japanese were offering up to $50,000 for a tuna. So they took off whatever boat they could find. So there's 19-footers, 20-footers. Well, one, one boat, a 19-foot, let me see if I get the name here, the Christiane in September that year caught a tuna and capsized. Very same day, another, another boat called uh, the Basic Instinct, 27-footer, was capsized by a tuna. Finally, the 28-footer, the guy... You see, because they, they had this prize, they were tempted by the $50,000. They didn't listen to the word of warning, and they were sunk. And God has given us words of warning. He says, don't do this. It'll sink your life. But sometimes uh, we listen to the wrong voice, don't we? And we give in. Jesus' second time, standing on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down for it's written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So the Satan takes Jesus to the corner of the temple, probably about 150, 200 feet above the Kidron Valley down below. You can see a long ways. And he says, look, if you're really the son of God, doesn't the scripture say that his angels will bury you up in your hands unless you strike your foot against a stone? Jump! 
prove to everybody, prove everybody sees that you really are the Messiah. Show them the power that you have. All right? It's a temptation to Jesus to force others to believe he's a son of God. Do something sensational. Right? <clears throat> Jesus, if you want to be somebody valuable, you got to stand out. You got to make people notice you. Let people know what you can do, right? Let them see you, can, you need to be needed, man. They, you know, just force them to believe. This is a pride and ego thing, by the way. And we all deal with that, don't we? Wanting people to notice this and make, us, make them think we're pretty good people and pat us on the back. I mean, we all struggle with that. Wanting to be liked and accepted. And he's pulling out. He says, you know, do something sensational. He says, in fact, Satan quotes scripture here. Can command his angels concerning you, guide you in all your ways, lest you strike your foot against a stone, right? They'll lift you up in your hands, right? Psalms 91, 11 and 12. I kind of mess up who you really are. Satan knows scripture. And he knows scripture probably better than you do. So just because somebody or something quotes scripture to you and tries to get you to do something, if it's a temptation that you know is wrong, don't do it. Okay? Don't do it. Because you really need to know who the Father is. You really need to know the heart of God. About getting close to him, about understanding who God is, his heart, his, his spirit. And once you understand who God is, you begin to grasp the, the fullness of scripture. And how people try to twist scripture and use scripture in ways that are not biblical. In fact, many want to throw scriptures around to make them sound like they're somebody. Remember this. Whenever the devil wants you to do something, it's a bad idea. Nothing else out of that. It's going to be repeated a few more times. Whenever the devil wants you to do something. So Jesus said, do not put the Lord your God to the test the Satan's, uh, you know, the psalm, he simply quotes Deuteronomy again. Deuteronomy 6, 16. Don't put the Lord your God to the test. And there's the, the, the added words at, as you did at Massah. Massah was a place where the people demanded God and wanted water, and they, they needed it right now, and, and Massah means testing. They were testing God. All right? And Jesus recognized that, that this, this ruse by Satan is a test in which the son is to test the father. A faith dependent on miracles is not real faith. The servants of God can't, de can't keep demanding that God do something miraculous all the time. Do the miracle, Jesus. Do the miracle. Do the miracle. Do the miracle. Because you begin to depend on miracles rather than... And trusting in God's will is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be trusting in God's will. And sometimes, can I say, his will doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes what God wills just is said, but I don't understand, Father. I say, that's okay. I don't ask you to understand. I just ask you to trust me. I mean, I just can't imagine why I couldn't understand God. You would think this seven pounds of gray matter that sits on top of this weird body could figure him out, right? Right? So we find, first of all, Satan adapts his temptation to Jesus. He adapts it to the circumstances. And he'll do the same thing for you, right? And he even tempt us with our beliefs. Tempt us with religion. The temple was the center of religion in Israel. It's where everybody went to worship. And Jesus take, or Satan takes him to the pinnacle of the temple using religion against Jesus to get Jesus to sin. That should be eye-opening to you and me. The third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, so if you'll bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, You will worship the Lord your God and serve him only. A very high mountain that kind of reminds us of Moses on Mount Nebo, who God showed the promised land. First of all, there's probably no, there is no mountain in the world that he could have taken him to to show him all the kingdoms of the world. So this must have been a place where he took him just to a mountain and kind of maybe fleshed him before Jesus' eyes, whatever. All of the kingdoms and all their glory and all their splendor. He says, all this is mine, it's yours if you'll worship me. Jesus, you can change the world by accepting power. 
by becoming like the world. Gain worldly power, gain worldly glory, and then you can change it, Jesus. This is the acceptance of temptation to Jesus to abandon his calling. Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to suffer and die. You don't have to bleed for anything. You don't have to be beaten and whipped and mocked and made fun of. You don't have to do any of that, Jesus. This is a lot easier way to go. Just bow down and worship me, and everything you come to save, I'll give to you. That's what he does to us. Take the easy way. Take the easy path. You don't have to face all the struggles of life. Just worship this way. Don't take the shortcut. It's a temptation to compromise and take an easier way. Jesus' response is, away from me, Satan. First time he gets angry. He's been pretty patient at this point. He's, you know, pretty strong emotion. Away from me, Satan. He's rejecting everything Satan is on him. He chooses the path of pain. He chooses the path of torture. He chooses the cross over the easy way. And that ought to be something that just stands out to us. You know, sometimes the way that we should follow is the way of the cross. That's harder. That's denying self. That's giving our lives for a cause that's Christ's cause and not our cause. It's loving others, even our enemies, enough to give our lives for them. That's a hard path to take. Again, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy. In fact, he quotes from Deuteronomy, every three, all three of him only, and take your oath in his name. That's a quote from Deuteronomy 6.13. And God in there saying, look, I'm a jealous God. I'll punish you if you don't honor me with your life. Jesus saying, I'm committed to my Father. I am committed to to my father. I do not compromise. I will not compromise. I will serve him only. It's worth knowing that Satan is offering Jesus all the authority of the world. And when Jesus presents the great commission after his death and resurrection, he says, all authority has been given to me. He's, he's going to get it, dying and rising again. But he gets it. Satan will tempt us to take the easy way. Avoid the pain. Avoid the struggle. Avoid all the heartache. Don't do it. Demand that God does things your way. You can quote the scripture. Demand God does things your way. Don't do it. Remember that old show? Always stay committed to Jesus. Don't compromise. There's an old Russian story. I don't know if you ever heard it, maybe at all, I can't remember, but an old Russian story about a hunter went hunting for bears. And they, and, and, and they got out, he got out there and he found this bear and he raises the gun to shoot him. The bear says, wait a minute. What do you want? And the hunter says, I just, it's fine. All he wants is a meal. Let's compromise. A little bit later, the guy walked away with a fur coat, and the bear walked away with the meal. He ate the hunter. You got it? <laughs> be careful of compromise. Because remember this. Whenever the devil wants you to do something, it's a bad idea. Hebrews 2, 17, 18, it says this. For this reason... He, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every way. Though in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. That he might make atonement for the sins of people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. See that? When Jesus went through this temptation, he suffered. That's what the author of Hebrews says. I, Jesus suffered in these moments. If you read the temptation story in, in Luke, it says, then a devil left him until an opportune time. So he must have continually been tempted. That makes sense. You know, when you win one battle against the devil, he doesn't give up. He just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. Any way he can to get you away from the living God, to get you distracted into something else, get you focused on another God or something else in your life that he, you think is more important than the living God. Be careful. Because you never know when you're eating poop brownies. 
I don't know, maybe you read the story. It was some years back. A, a, a middle school in Oregon had trouble with the girls. They were learning, they were starting to use lipstick. They were putting lipstick on their faces. And when they did, they were in the girls' restroom. So after they do it, they would kiss the mirror. And they were leaving the lip prints. The, 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 the principal of the school, she was a lady. She said, please, ladies, don't do that. It was really hard for the janitor to clean that off the mirror. And they kept doing They kept doing She finally talked to the janitor, and they, they arrived at maybe a way to help him stop. So she called some of the ladies into the ladies' restroom, the girls. said, girls, I want you to see how hard this is for the janitor to clean off the lip prints that you put on the mirror every time you do it. It's really hard for him. Or dipped it in the toilet and went over and wiped the mirror <laughs> with the mop. <clears throat> Guess what? It stopped. <laughs> Which just says, if you know the poop brownies you're really eating, you'd stop giving in to temptation. Amen? Amen. Nobody's going to have poop brownies for lunch, are they? <laughs> Thank you for your word. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us to realize that we need to deal with temptation in a way that helps us to strengthen our faith with you and not weaken it. So I pray, Lord, for all of us that are here today, all those who are watching on Facebook, that, Father, you'll give us the grace, the strength, the power, the insight, the Lord, to see, I'm going to say, see the poop that Satan is offering us in that temptation. Father, help us to keep our lives pure and holy. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, thank you. You are dismissed.